Hey everybody, in this video, we're gonna be covering the 2023 AP Biology FRQ test that happened on May 10th, 2023. If you haven't met yet, my name is Mr. Chow and I'm a passionate AP Biology teacher. And it's my honor every year to do a review of the AP FRQ in hopes that you can learn something from this video. It's really important to know that the official scoring guidelines from the AP College Board uh, team have not been released. Usually they're released in July. And when they are, I'm gonna put a link to uh, those official scoring guidelines um, in the description below. Everything in this video uh, is um, is not official. And these are my predictions when it comes to the uh, possible uh, AP Biology FRQ uh, answers. If what you put uh, is not on this video, uh, it's really important to know that there can be multiple answers um, on the AP scoring guidelines. So let's be patient and wait for that to come out. A few more remind, um, reminders before we get going in this video, uh, the purpose of this video. I really want to start with the purpose. Uh, really, it's really to help anybody. But if you're a student that just took the AP exam, hopefully this is helpful and encouraging that you did great. Um, if you haven't taken this AP exam yet, but you will be taking an AP exam in the future, this is for you as well. Hopefully this is um, helpful in your preparation for your big test. If you're a teacher and you need some help reviewing and explaining FRQs to your students, I hope this is helpful to you. If you're a parent, um, this is a good, uh, this video, and we'll give you a good idea of how difficult this AP biology test is, and, but also kind of what it entails. And most of all, the purpose of this video is just for fun. I truly enjoy going over these FRQs every year. I don't know if I'm correct on everything, but I'm going to try and, uh, hopefully this is helpful to you. Uh, once again, quick, 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 uh, reminders before we really get going here, timestamps. If you want to jump ahead to any FRQ question, please feel free to do so. I'll put timestamps below. You can jump to any FRQ you want. Below in the description already, there is a PDF link to um, the actual AP uh, FRQ release questions. So if you haven't taken this exam yet, maybe take it first and then take a look at some proposed answers after. And I'll also explain every uh, question to you. And then, as I said earlier, after the scoring guidelines get posted, I will post a link uh, below to where you can access the actual official scoring guidelines and answer keys. Three more things before we get going. I already said this. I'll say it again. This video was created and posted before the release of the AP Biology FRQ key. Uh, these are my best guesses. If you have another answer that you believe is the answer, please feel free to comment below. And I'm sure it's going to help anyone who's watching uh, this video. Finally, everything I do is not monetized. Um, I don't plan to be monetized at any point. Um, but if you know someone that could also benefit from watching this video, please share this link uh, with them. And uh, if you're really feeling inclined to help out, put a like on this video so that other people can view it as well. All right. Um, when I first started doing videos like this, it was a little uh, scary because I don't, once again, I don't want to um, 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 you know, break any rules or anything like that. But according to the AP College Board website, it says at the very bottom, if the eight, if the free response content on your AP exam is posted to the College Board website two days after the regular scheduled exam, you may discuss it at any point. So, the, so this is my discussion with you. It's been six days now since the exam uh, I was taken, so I feel pretty comfortable sharing this with you. Let's get going. Here we go. 2023 AP Biology FRQ questions. There are six of them. The first two are longer questions worth more points. And then the last four are shorter FRQs are worth less points. Okay. Here we go. FRQ number one. For each of these, I'm going to read it out. I'm going to kind of explain to you what I'm thinking behind the scenes. And then if you want to jump ahead, you can jump ahead to the actual proposed answers uh, ahead. I'm just going to read it to you. In, in eukaryotic microorganisms, the PHO signaling pathway regulates the expression of certain genes. These genes, these faux target genes, encode proteins involved in regulating phosphate homeostasis. After I read that, uh, I immediately thought, okay, this question is about phosphate and it's about homeostasis, about keeping an internal constant as our bodies normally do. When the level of extracellular outside the cell, phosphate is high, okay, so this is the first point, the transcriptional activator, FO4, is phosphorylated in a complex of two proteins, FO80 and FO85. As an AP biology teacher, I can tell you in my class, we have never learned about the FO signaling pathway, but we have learned about signaling pathways. So on AP exams, it's really important to know, you do not need to know all these details. You just need to know enough content to get kind of get you through it. And the question, as, we, as we've seen here, will tell you the rest. So as I am taking the exam, I'm circling, I'm circling phosphate homeostasis, but I'm also writing down what was just given to us. Now, when I write it, it means I don't have to reread it multiple times. So on, the, on my FRQ practice exam, I wrote down 
when phosphate is high, then the FO4 is phosphorylated, which means that the target genes are not expressed. Now, this kind of goes against what um, students may think, because they think whenever you phosphorylate something, you're activating something. But it just told us this specific pathway. It told us when you phosphorylate it, FO4, specifically FO4, then the target genes are not expressed. So you have to follow what the exam is telling you, not what you think or what you've read about in the textbook. Uh, as a result, the faux target genes are not expressed. When the level of extracellular phosphate is low, okay, so I'm gonna write this down, the activity of the faux 80 and faux 85 complex is inhibited by other protein, uh, enabling faux 4 to induce the expression of those target genes. A simplified model of this pathway is shown in figure one. So I wrote down what exactly what was given to us there real quick, phosphate low, fo 4 enabled to induce, and induce means kind of to turn on expression of the genes, okay? Here, uh, we're given this beautiful figure and we see A and B and in my mind, I'm not getting scared of like, oh, I didn't learn this. No, I'm sticking to what's given to me. On the left, I see high phosphate. And what that means is whenever there's a high phosphate, we, we just read fo 80 and fo 85 are turned on and they phosphorylate, they're dropping off the phosphate, they're phosphorylating, they're donating the phosphate to fo 4 And we learned that when that happens, there's actually, let's go back here, target genes are not expressed. On the right, I'm just, you know, processing what the information is given to me. On the right, um, I see that there's a low phosphate environment. Um, and what does that uh, turn into? It, it's, it enables fo 4 to turn on the expression of genes, as you can see. This one on the right, the low phosphate environment, will go ahead and directly impact the DNA. Now, when you impact DNA, what's going to happen? Protein synthesis, transcription, translation, ultimately amino, um, mRNAs will get created from transcription, and then proteins will get created through translation. All this is happening in my head in the first few minutes as I'm reading this question. Just um, It gives you a little bit more information, so let me just go a little bit more. To study the role of different proteins in the faux pathway, researchers use a wild type. Wild type means most common in the... Um, in the environment strain um, of yeast to create a strain with a mutant form of FO81 and a mutant strain of FO4. So there's two mutants, as I wrote down right here. Yeast is what's being used. So these are my little notes on the side. In each of these mutant strains, researchers measure the activity of a particular enzyme, this APase, which removes phosphate. So I wrote it down here. The enzyme used, APase, APase is what? It removes phosphate. So it's a phosphatase. Kinases donate phosphates. Phosphatases take away phosphates. So it's a phosphatase. And that is encoded by another FO1 target gene. And then there's a maximum of 10 in which they looked at the uh, FO1 mRNA relative to that of the wild type yeast strain. It gives you this information. And just so you know, anytime I look at tables, I, I do get a little scared at first because I'm like, oh, geez, I've never seen this. But I slow down and I go, wait a minute, what are the trends? So what are we looking at here? We're looking at APAs activity in low and high environments. Then we're looking at the relative amount of FO1 mRNA in high and low phosphate environments as well. Uh, the wild type is most common. Here's the values. And here are the two mutants that we looked at. And here are the values. The first things that jumped to my mind and where are my eyes going at the numbers that stand out. We see in the wild type here in APAs activity in low environments that it's a pretty high amount. And what's this table looking at? It tells you the APAs activity, relative amounts of that in the high and low uh, environments in, um, of yeast. And then I see here 10 is way bigger than one or, or 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.9 is pretty much one. So that stands out and this stands out as well. So that's already coming, um, happening in my head as I'm reading the question. Here are the four questions. I'm going to break them down one by one. And let's start with A. Describe the effect that the addition of the charged phosphate group can have on a protein that could cause the protein to become inactive. Now, once again, when you answer APFRQ, questions. You have to understand the first one. Usually it's A, B, C, D or A, B, C, D, E, F. I've seen them go up to like even G sometimes. Um, but whenever you take a look at that, um, you need to take a look at um, the, um, excuse me, uh, you need to understand the, um, and the question doesn't really refer. Okay. So A usually doesn't have anything to do with the question. Okay, it has to, everything to do with your background knowledge of biology. So as you can see, this is a very elementary question. It's a very standard question for a first question. But the giveaway was this end part. Uh, what will the char charged phosphate group have on the protein to make it become inactive? Do you see that? So the big difference there that I see is usually, as I said earlier, phosphates activate proteins. But in this case, it told you 
What caused it to become inactive? So that's a giveaway for the answer. Here's a proposed answer. A charged phosphate group can cause a protein to become inactive by changing the shape. We learned in class that shape determines function. And I'm telling you, as easy as that sounds, that's, I, that's what I think the answer is of the protein. By changing the shape of the protein, the, shape, uh, the protein may not be able to activate its coupled signal transaction pathway anymore. Okay, because proteins are usually the uh, receptors that ligands bind to, et cetera. As you can see, it's going to go ahead and um, affect the overall pathway. And then it says here, explain how a signal can be amplified. We learned that in cell communication, there's reception, transduction, and response. And in the transduction phase, that's where the amplification happens. That's why transduction is so important to amplify the signal um, for it to have a greater effect. So here's the answer to that second part. A signal can be amplified during signal transduction in a pathway such as the faux signaling pathway through, and the three that we talked about in our class was the G-protein coupled receptor, the tyrosine kinases, and the ligand uh, gated ion channels. Okay, I'm gonna continue here. This is because when a signal ligand binds to uh, one of these receptors, each of the receptors can then release hundreds or, or more secondary messenger molecules such as CAM, and this is what we learned in class, which each binds to separate proteins. Each of these proteins in turn can potentially lead to the release of even more secondary messengers molecules. Thus, in a signal transduction pathway such as FO, the signaling, a signal cell signaling molecule can potentially cause a phosphorylation cascade. We learned that in class as well. That results in a major change in the cell's function behavior. This answer has way more than you actually probably need to get 100%, but I just want to give you as much information as possible. So if you didn't write this much, please do not worry. Most likely, as long as you have these main points, uh, you got the points um, as well, All right? Let's go on to the next. All right, let's take a look at B. Based on table one, identify a dependent variable in the researcher's experiment. So let's start with that one. So when you take a look at charts like this, you know that one of them has to be your independent variable, what you are manipulating or changing as the experimenter. And then one of them has to be the dependent variable, which is how you're measuring your goal. As you can see here, there's really two choices. It's either the yeast strain, those are the three different ones, or it's all of these different uh, things that we're looking for. And the answer is it's going to be, I think it's going to be the APAS activity up here, because this is really what you are measuring, uh, which yeast strain is the best, et cetera. So it's got to be up here. Um, so here's a proposed answer. B, a, deep, the, a dependent variable in the researcher's experiment is APAS activity. So that's straight up. If you put relative amounts of FO1 mRNA, and that could be the answer, I don't know. Um, but I would just stick to this one right here because usually you can't have more than one. Um, actually, I guess you could have more than one dependent variable. It's usually you don't want more than one independent variable. So I'll stick to the APS activity, but we'll see when the answer key, uh, key comes out. Tech, uh, next question or next part of the question. Justify the researchers um, using the wild type strain for the creation of mutant strains. So why are we creating mutants? As you go back here, why are we creating these two down here? Well, the quick answer right here, the researchers used the wild type strain to create the mutant strains because they wanted to ensure that all variables except for the independent variables are controlled and stay constant. And then justify the researchers using the mutant strains in which only a single thing was mutated in each strain. You don't even need to know this question uh, to really answer this correctly. You just need to know how experiments usually are most successful. So this last part, the researchers used mutant strains in which only a single component of the pathway was mutated in each strain so that they were easily able to isolate the cause uh, of the certain trends in the data. So hopefully this is helpful. This is B, and that's what we got there. C, based on the data in table one, identify the yeast strain and growth conditions that lead to the highest relative amount of FO1 mRNA. When I look at FO1 mRNA, I'm looking at these two over here. And then I'm looking at the yeast strain. So which one was the highest and best when it comes to uh, that one? And immediately what comes to my mind is this one right here. So that's the highest one right there. So uh, we're going to write that. The yeast strain and growth conditions that led to the highest relative amount of FO1 mRNA were the wild type yeast strains in low PI environment. Wild type yeast strains in low PI environment. That's really what we're looking for because that's what the question asks for. Okay, now the next part, calculate the percent change in, it's not calculating the percent change in that one. It says calculate the percent change in APAS activity in the wild type yeast cells in a high phosphate environment compared to that of a wild type cells in a low PI environment. So it's really asking for this. Compare these two values in the wild type environment from low, from high to low. All right, here's my prediction on 
how you can calculate the percent change. So whenever you look at percent change, I'm going to go here. It's usually you look for the increase and you divide that by the original number and you times it by 100. So let me show you the math that's going on in my head when I'm taking a look at something like this. I'm going to, once again, take these two and I'll put this on the screen right here for you. Uh, as you can see, it's it's going to be 17.3 uh, or, or 0 0.5 minus 17.3, which is negative 16.8 divided by 17.3 times 100. And that I got negative 97.1. If you put 97.1, I don't know if they'll accept that, but we'll see. Maybe they will. I don't know the scoring guidelines. This couldn't even be the, maybe it's not even the answer, but I'm, I'm just kind of showing you what's going on in my head as I get to the answer. All right, let's take a look at D. In a follow-up experiment, this, I think this is the last one, for number one, researchers created a strain of yeast with a mutation that resulted in a non-functional FO85 protein. So once again, I don't know if you remember earlier, but FO80 and FO85 are, in, are essential for phosphorylating FO4, which will then inactivate the involvement with DNA. So I'm looking back to this figure. Based on figure one, which is what we just said, predict the effects of this mutation on the FO expression in the mutant strain in a high PI environment, which is this one right here. Provide reasoning to justify your uh, prediction. All right, here's an answer for D. I predict that this mutation will result in a significantly or in a significant increase in the levels of FO1 expression in the mutant strain in a high PI environment. This is because, as we said earlier, this mutation will, re will result in a non-functional FO85 protein. So this means that the activity of the FO80 and FO85 complex will be inhibited. Therefore, FO80 and FO85 can no longer phosphorylate FO4. I just um, showed you that earlier. Since FO4 is no longer phosphorylated, this means that it is no longer inhibited. Therefore, FO4 can induce the expression of FO target genes, resulting in a large increase in the levels of FO1 mRNA expression. Okay. So going back, yep, that's pretty much what we're looking at. And we're looking at this first environment, not expressed. Okay. Hopefully that was helpful to your understanding. I know, I know that was a bit long because the first two are a little bit longer, but hopefully these next ones will speed up. Here we go. FRQ number two. Uh, and this is another long FRQ. I'm going to read it to you. So feel free to jump ahead if you want to take a look at the scoring guidelines. Elevated levels of CO2 increase the rate of photosynthesis and growth in plants. In my mind, immediately, I know we know what photosynthesis is, but I always write it down. We know that plants require water, CO2, and light to activate as reactants. And that's going to push a reaction to creating glucose for the plant for food and then creating oxygen for the environment. So I know that this is already something we know, but I always write it down on an APFRQ so I don't have to think about it. So as you can see, the elevated levels of CO2 increase the rate of photosynthesis. Okay, that makes sense. And growth in plants. Scientists studying the mechanisms involved in these increases examined a variety of species and found uh, when plants are exposed to elevated levels of CO2, there's an increase in the number of chloroplasts per cell to investigate. So I'm just writing down some notes. What was just told us uh, told to us there? More CO2 equals more chloroplasts equals more photosynthesis. That's what the question just told us. To investigate whether the elevated levels of CO2 have a similar effect on the number of mitochondria, that's really what we're looking at. That's the investigation. Will more mitochondria be in plant cells because of that? The scientists then selected six of these species to quantify the number of mitochondria per cell when the plants were exposed to both normal and elevated uh, levels of CO2. All right. So here's the table that's given to us as well for FRK number two. Here's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the six species. I'm looking, okay, mitochondria at normal CO2, mitochondria at elevated CO2. That's what we're, uh, we're looking at. And immediately I'm seeing a difference. I'm seeing that when elevated, when there's elevated CO2, the mitochondria, as you can see here, uh, for, per cell area is higher, 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 about two times higher here, higher, higher. Yeah, on most of them, about two times. Not exactly two times, but about two times. So that's what's going on in my head. Here are the four questions that we're going to look at. Let's start with A. Describe the role of the inner mitochondrial membrane in cell respiration. As I told you, usually the first part of every FRQ, it's not really related to the question. It's about what background information do you know about this concept? So here's a proposed answer. You don't have to write as much as this, but here's a proposed answer. We know that the inner mitochondrial membrane is important for cellular, cellular respiration because it is what separates the inner membrane space and the mitochondrial matrix. Remember the mitochondria, outer membrane, inner membrane, the inner membrane's folded so that there's cristae, there's increased surface area for what? Cellular respiration, we're trying to maximize that. And is the barrier that allows for oxidative phosphorylation. Ox oxidative phosphorylation, as we learned, is the third stage in cellular respiration. There's glycolysis, there's the Krebs cycle slash the citric acid cycle, and then there's the oxidative phosphorylation. So I'm gonna keep reading. 
an important part of cellular respiration to occur. During cellular respiration, protons, as we know, H+, are pumped from the matrix into the intramembrane space, creating a high to low kind of environment um, because of the electron transport chain. That's what opens the proteins as we've learned in oxidative phosphorylation. So really what you're doing is you're ensuring the point that's given to you here by telling them, hey, I know what cellular respiration is and I know the impact of the inner mitochondrial membrane. I'm gonna finish off this. The inner mitochondrial membrane contains the proteins and enzymes that facilitate this process and is a barrier that allows the proton gradient to be established, high to low. Due to the gradient, the H plus goes back into the matrix. How? Going through an enzyme called the ATP synthase and that is what allows chemiosmosis to happen embedded in the inner membrane and causing ATP to be formed, thus completing cellular respiration. I know I'm getting more information, but for those of you who haven't taken the exam yet, I really hope this is helpful to you. That was A. B, using the template in the space provided for your response, construct an appropriately labeled graph that represents the data in table one, determine which species shows a difference in the number of mitochondria between the two. So here's the data. First thing you need to know what goes on your x-axis, what goes on your y-axis. Well, x is going to be your independent variable. So what are we manipulating or trying to figure out? Um, and, and on the y-axis is the dependent variable, which is how are you going to measure which one's the best? Well, what are we manipulating? The species, one through six. That's really what we're testing. How are we going to figure out which species is the best? Well, we're going to take a look at the mitochondrial levels uh, in each of them, normal and elevated levels of CO2. Here's a proposed graph. And I believe it gave you, yep the title. So all you need to do is transfer the title. Um, if you didn't graph it this way, maybe they, uh, they're going to accept other graphs, but here's a proposed graph. Six species on the bottom. You just literally graph them out. And if you've never seen error bars, like we've talked in class, what, what you're going to do, let's take a look for species one. You're going to graph 1.0. So you can see 1.0 right there. It's just 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 6. Okay. Just kidding. One, uh, 1. 1.0 right there. And then you're going to go up. Uh, sorry about that. You're going to go up by 0. 0.1. So I'm going to zoom in here. So you're going to go up by 1.1 uh, and you're going to create the high value for the error bar. And then you're going to go down to like 0 0.9, as you can see right there. So that's what you're going to do for every one of these. And this is how it should look like. Okay, so something along the lines of this. All right, they may accept another graph. We'll see when the scoring guidelines come out, but hopefully that's helpful. C, based on the data in table one, describe the relationship between the level of CO2 and the average number of mitochondria per, per unit area. So pretty straightforward, as we talked about earlier, here's a proposed answer. Based on the data, I conclude that there is a positive relationship or just a relationship between the level of CO2 and the average number of mitochondria per unit area of a cell. Pretty straightforward. Are you able to read a data table and write about it? The more or elevated amount CO2 present, the greater the average number of mitochondria per unit area of a cell. All right, so that's C. D. This one, here we go. It's like an extension. The leaves of a particular plant species are typically green. But scientists noticed that uh, uh, a plant in which the leaves have white stripes, okay? So usually it's green, but there's white stripes. They determined that these stripes result from mutation in the mitochondrial uh, DNA that interferes with the development of chloroplasts. The scientists cross plants using pollen from a plant with white striped leaves and ovules, uh, so fe uh, female parts from a plant with green leaves. Predict the phenotype of the leaves of offspring produced from this cross, provide reasoning um, sorry about that. By reasoning to justify your prediction. Okay, let's begin. So let's predict the phenotype in case there's this cross. Okay, so I will predict that the leaves of all the offspring will have what? Green leaves. The reason why it's green leaves here, let me explain this, is because the white stripe phenotype of the plant came from a mutation in the mitochondrial DNA. Now we know that mitochondrial DNA is inherited from the maternal plant. And in this scenario, the scientists crossed the pollen of the white leaf plant with the ovules of the green leaf plant. Okay, so let me go on here and explain this a little bit more. The ovule is the female structure of a plant, and thus the green leaf plant will be passing down its mitochondrial DNA to that, and that's what's inherited. The green leaf plant mitochondrial DNA that does not contain the mutation, and thus its offspring will not develop its white stripes. Plants with the same genotype are able to dif differ in structure slash number of organelles in response to changes in CO2 due to epigenetics. You don't have to go this far, but uh, we've learned in class epigenetic factors are environmental factors that can give gene expression or affect gene expression. In this example, CO2 acts as an environmental control that affects the expression of mitochondria. You do not need to do all that. You could have probably justified or explained it without the epigenetics, but I just wanted to throw that in there. Hopefully that helps. All right, FRQ3. The last four are shorter, so hang with me here. And hopefully this is helpful. Feel free to jump ahead if you want to go to another one. Uh, let's take a look at three. 
Sand lances of the genus, the ammodites, are small fish. Have we learned about sand lances? No. Have we learned about ammodites? No, but we've learned about small fishes. So just know that small fishes uh, that function as keystone species, we've learned about that. And these are going to be in the lower uh, trophic levels. And how do we know that? It says that these are prey fish that support organisms at higher trophic levels. Scientists performed experiments to examine how sand lance populations are likely to be affected by the uh, temperatures and the CO2 levels associated with climate change. So the big question is this, how affected, how is it affected by rising temperatures and CO2 levels? And then it says down here that, that the embryos uh, typically develop and mature into adult fish at low temperatures, approximately five degrees Celsius and stable low CO2 levels, approximately that. Immediately I'm thinking, okay, that's my control. Over the course of two years, scientists measured survival rate of these embryos allowed to develop and mature at three different temperatures, five, seven, 10, and different CO2 levels, 400,000 and 2,100 for each temperature. So embryos develop at low temperatures and low CO2. So this is what's happening or what I'm writing down as little side notes. Four questions here. Let's start with A. Describe the effect of increased biodiversity on the resilience of an ecosystem uh, by a changing environment. So this really doesn't have anything to do with the question, but it just asks you to see how much you know about biodiversity. Increased biodiversity increases the resilience of an ecosystem by changing an environment. Okay, it increases the resilience. This is because increased biodiversity results in increased species richness and genetic diversity within populations. Increased species richness ensures that the species are not fully independent dependent on one another, and increased genetic diversity within populations allows them to evolve in changing environments. B. It says, justify the scientists selecting 5 degrees Celsius as the lowest temperature and 400. So why are they selecting that in their study? And as you can go back, they're doing 5, 7, 10, 400,000 and 2,100. Why are they selecting those two as lowest? Well, because it told us earlier in the question, the scientists chose these conditions because they replicate standard conditions in a typical sand lance development. They told that to us in the question and matures in serving as the control variable, as I said earlier. The scientists are, ex are examining the effect of rising temperatures and CO2 levels. So the other temperatures and CO2 levels are higher than the control. That's B. C, the null hypothesis. We've learned in class that the hypothesis is an educated guess. It is your best prediction. The null hypothesis is kind of the opposite of the hypothesis. So how do you get the null? Usually you find the hypothesis and you flip it. So here's my proposal for the null hypothesis. Sand lands, embryos do not mature and develop at different rates with increased temperatures and CO2 levels. That's it. You don't need to explain it or anything. Just state it. Whenever it says state, state it. So once again, a hypothesis, why do you think they're doing 5, 7, 10? Perhaps with the increase of temperature, with the increase of uh, CO2 levels, there's going to be a difference. That would be the hypothesis. Null would be most likely there's no difference or it will not, okay? Let's see. D, the scientists claim that a reduction in the population side of the ammodites and, land, and uh, sand lasses will affect the stability of the entire coastal ecosystem. Provide reasoning to support the scientists' claim. Here's a proposed answer. Same is true. Because the ammodite sand lances function as a keystone species. It asks you, well, how is it gonna affect the stability, right? So there's reasoning here and there's support. So they're prey fish that support organisms at high trophic levels. That's straight from the question. Thus, a reduction in the population would result in what? Less food for the predators. We've talked about food chains. If you affect the bottom line, it's going to affect the next one. It's going to affect the next one. Everything uh, works in, in, um, in community. Um, but a keystone species is super important to the stability and biodiversity. Keystone species hold together the ecosystem. Without them, the stability and biodiversity will decline. There's no one that can fulfill the role, the niche, of an organism such as the keystone species. So it's really important. All right, so there's D and hopefully that helps. Let's go to FRK number four, here we go. Um, Non-cyclic electron flow and cyclic electron flow. So already I'm thinking about PS2, PS1 that we've learned in photosynthesis, the light dependent reactions are two major reactions of the light dependent reactions of photosynthesis. Okay, so once again, I quickly wrote out photosynthesis again to remind me. And I know that light reactions includes PS2 and PS1. Go back and learn that if you need to, if you haven't taken it yet. Light reaction reactants. So what goes into the light reaction? I know that light comes in, water is um, broken down, and O2 comes out. Okay, so those are my reactants, and these are my products of what? The light-dependent reactions. Look at the textbook. It's on the left. That's different than the light-independent um, reactions, which is the Calvin cycle. Okay. In non-cyclic electron flow, electrons pass through PS2, 
then uh, components of the chloroplast electron transfer chain leading to PS1 before finally reducing, which means gaining an electron, NADP plus into NADPH, which NADPH has the electron. It's a high energy electron carrier for photosynthesis. In cyclic electron flow, it's just involving PS1. The electrons cycle through and some components of the electron transfer chain. This picture is given. It's different than the one we have in class, but it's really the same thing. Okay, sure, it doesn't have all the colors and stuff that we look at in our textbook, but as you can see here, here's PS2, here's PS1, here's the first ETC, and here's the second ETC, and you're creating ATP and NADPH for the Calvin cycle. Okay, so we'll come back to that. Here's the four questions. Let's start with A. Describe the role of chlorophyll in the photosystems of plant cells. So what is the role of chlorophyll? We know that chlorophyll is a pigment, and, and, and it what? Absorbs the sunlight coming in. We need sunlight for photosynthesis. They're light-dependent reactions. So here we go. Here's a proposed answer. Chlorophyll is the pigment in the photosystems that absorbs, in both photosystems, that absorbs light energy from the sun, converting it into chemical energy. Um, chloroplast plays roles in the first step of photosynthesis, absorbing energy that we'll use to what? Break down water into O2 gas. We just talked about that. And power the electron transfer chain to make ATP. Um, quickly in class, we do something where it's like energy comes in and it, whoop, it boosts the electron up. When electrons are in an excited state, they're able to go down to ATC and do work to create ATP and NADPH. So that's really what we're going to write about for A. B, based on the figure. Here we go. Always take a look back at the figures. Explain why an increase in the ratio of NADPH and NADP will cause increase in the flow of electrons through the what, cyclic pathway. So just think about this. Why will an increase in the ratio of NADPH cause this to happen? And here's a quick answer. An increase in the ratio of NADPH and NADP plus will cause an increase in the cyclic pathway. Why? Because it means that enough NADPH has been produced. So that's pretty straightforward, resulting in a non-cyclic electron pathway being inhibited in favor of the cyclic pathway to instead generate more ATP and where no NADPH is produced. Okay, so pretty straightforward. It means that there's none. And that's it. I think that's the proposed answer. C, using rice plant scientists examine the effect of a mutation that results in the loss of the protein CRR6. We've never studied CRR6, but it tells us here that CRR6 is a part of the photosystem one complex. That's all you need to know. And its absence reduces what? The activity of photosystem one. Predict the effect of the mutation on the rate of biomass. Think about it. How is biomass calculated? It's how much glucose is is produced because glucose is weight. Glucose is food. Glucose is sugar. All right. So here's an answer. Um, I predict that the mutation will result uh, in a decrease in the rate of biomass or dry weight accumulation. Why will it have a decrease in that? It didn't ask you to explain fully. It just explained why. And the quick answer is because of this mutation and because its absence reduces the activity. So if you reduce the activity, then you're not creating the products that will lead to producing more glucose and biomass and dry weight accumulation. D, now it asks you to justify here as well. This is because photosystem one, as I said earlier, plays an important role in generating both ATP and NADPH, both in which play an important role in generating glucose. And that's the Calvin cycle later on, light independent reactions and other organic compounds in photosynthesis. Photosystem one accepts the electrons that are needed to generate the proton gradient that creates ATP. It is also needed to harvest the light energy needed to drive the second ETC that reduces the NADP plus into NADPH. Without ATP and NADPH, CO2 cannot be fixed and organic compounds glucose cannot be made. Do you need to write all this? No, but if you, as long as you wrote something along the lines of this, you should be in good shape. Organic compounds are what makes up the majority of the plant's weight, and a reduction in the production of compounds results in a decreased biomass accumulation. All right, there's FRQ4. FRQ5, here we go, finish strong, two more. So on this one, it, it asks you to take a look at ruminants. Um, uh, ruminants are hooved animals, including cattle and sheep, that's what you need to know, and they have unique four chambered stomachs to specialize in digesting tough fiber-filled grasses. So I'm just writing down hoofed animals, digest tough grasses. Researchers studying uh, ruminants are investigating morphological and molecular uh, characteristics of different ruminant families in order to determine the evolutionary relationships among the families. Cladograms, we've learned this in class, of several ruminant um, families were um, constantly based on uh, more morphological data, figure 1A and morphological Okay, so we're taking a look at morphological and we're taking a look at molecular data, so like amino acids and stuff like that. 
So those are the two. So we're studying those two differences in evolutionary related things. They give us these two. And once again, on top, A is a morphological. That's like physically. Uh, and then uh, molecular would be more amino acid. Which one's more? Already I'm thinking which one's more important. Uh, I would say amino acid because that's the genetic level versus the phenotype. The phenotype can change because of mutation or something like that. But the amino acids are probably a little better at figuring out whether or not two species are connected or not. I cannot pronounce these names, but in my mind on an FRQ test, it doesn't, you don't even need to pronounce it. So uh, I would just think T-G-B-M-A-C. And that's how I would kind of take a look at it. And you'll see how I do that. So as you can see, they give us one more uh, table. There's three characteristic numbers. There's all these different um, morphological characteristics, extra teeth, third stomach, et cetera. And it just tells you which one has which. And that's really important when it comes to figuring out some uh, similarities between these different organisms. Here are the four questions. I'm going to read through them one by one. Let's begin. A, describe how a scientist would use a comparison of the DNA sequences of different organisms to, to, to suggest that most likely evolutionary relationship among uh, the organism. Here's the answer. Here's the proposed answer. A scientist would use a comparison of the DNA sequences of different organisms to suggest, to suggest the most likely evolutionary relationship among the organisms by comparing shared genes between the organisms more similar to organisms genes sequences are to each other, the more likely that they have a close evolutionary relationship. You don't even need to know the question to answer this question. You just need to know in general, do you understand how um, scientists can use DNA sequences okay, and to compare them? B, based on figure one, explain how B is likely to be um, closely related to M than it is to G. B to M than to G. Okay, so how is that? Well, let's take a look at that. B and M are very similar amino acid wise, but B and M are very different when it comes to uh, the morphological differences. Okay, here's a proposed answer. You don't have to write as much, but here's a proposed answer. Uh, B, and I don't want to pronounce it, but B is most likely, this organism is most likely to be more closely related to M than to G because according to the molecular data in figure 1B, the bottom one, B and M are most closely related. I'll show you right there. Uh, due to the two differences, uh, sorry, due to the two species being in the same branch of the cladogram. Um, although the morphological data is in figure 1A suggests that B is more closely related to G than M. We said that in the earlier one. If the two species being on the same branch, this is not necessarily the case because what? Morphological similarities, I said this earlier, between different organisms are not always indicative of shared evolutionary history. The amino acid, the molecular differences are more indicative of that. Similar morphological um, characteristics could have resulted from conversion evolution, mutation, or anything like that, instead of a shared ancestor. Therefore, the data in figure 1b, which suggests that the b organism is more closely related to m, is more likely accurate than the data in figure 1a. Let's take a look at c. Using the template in the space provided for your response, represent the uh, points, and it says it could be more than one points, which characteristic one listed in table one evolved by marking X on the line or lines of the cladogram in the um, correct locations. All right. So as you can see here, here's table one. Here's what we're looking at. It represents the points at, at which that. Okay. So as you can see, here is the, um, so you're just going to mark an X. And I believe in which characteristic one, which is the extra uh, tooth material B and A, as you can see, if B and A have the marks, then, so here's the question on the exam. I predict, here's the proposed answer, that you would just do it there. Now, you can't do it here, because if you do it here, then you're saying everything to the right has it, which it doesn't. Only B and A have it. Um, so if only B and A have it, then each of them should have it on their um, um, smaller branch only. Can't do it here, because if you do it here, then you're saying G and A have it. But it's saying only B and A have it, so I think the two X's should be there. Could be wrong but I'm pretty sure it's that, okay? And then D, explain why a characteristic found only in the C and B families is more likely evidence of convergent evolution than it is of common ancestry. We'll take a look at C and B. They're pretty far apart, and that's the first thing I'm noticing. So here's a proposed answer. You don't have to write as much, but here's a proposed answer. A characteristic found only in the C and B families is more likely evidence of convergent evolution versus common ancestry because according to the figure 1A, B is most closely related to G, right there, while C is mostly uh, related to, uh, to A. So really, these two don't really have that much of a connection. Um, 
since C and B are more, are not more closely related to one another, any shared morphological characteristics will most likely have evolved separately rather than being passed down to both species. Furthermore, according to 1A, C and B share a common ancestor with G, M, and A, as we saw earlier. Therefore, if any shared morphological characteristic was passed down from a common ancestor, it should likely be seen in the G, M, A species, but it's not. Since only C and B have the most larger characteristics, it's more likely that it's convergent evolution. So you would just say that, look, these two are really different. Uh, and, you know, everything here would have been impacted, but it wasn't. It was only those two. All right. So that's FRQ5. Last one. Let's go. All right. Here we go. Six. Housekeeping genes, which we have not talked about in class, but you don't need to have learned about it before. You just got to look at what they're uh, telling you here. So part one of the two parts, housekeeping genes encode proteins. Uh, so I just wrote then housekeeping genes. Involved in universally important processes, such as transcription, translation, and glycolysis, because these genes appear uh, to be expressed in all cells, constant level expression of housekeeping genes is often used as a control when comparing how the expression of other genes varies in different conditions. Researchers studying the effect of pesticides on declining bee populations wanted to determine whether the expression of four housekeeping genes, those four, was in fact constant in bees across different variables. The researchers collected samples of mRNA for each of the four genes and compared how their expression varied from the developmental stage of the bee, the sex of the bee, and the cell type uh, in which the sample was taken. The mRNA from the samples were reverse transcribed to produce DNA. And then PCR was used, which is this method to mass copy DNA, used to amplify the DNA, and the CQ value was determined. The CQ value is the number of PCR cycles needed to produce a specified number of DNA copies, a high CQ value, it's told you this, for a sample includes the gene that was ex uh, was expressed at a low level. Okay, so we'll give you a lot of information. We're gonna come back to this in a bit. To analyze whether the any of the examined variables affect the gene expression of the housekeeping genes, researchers examine the range of the CQ values for each response. Genes with a wide range of CK values were determined to be affected by the variable, I wrote that down on here, and those with a narrow range of CK values were unaffected by variable. All this information will help you figure out the answer. Always read the question. All right, so let's begin. Here's what the table that's given to you. Here's the, 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 the developmental differences between the four. Here's the sex, and here's the cell types. Already I'm seeing things that are jumping out at me, things that are off, things that are different, bigger versus smaller, et cetera. So let's stick to uh, with the question. A, based on the data in figure one, identify the gene that had the lowest median CQ value when um, bees of different Velma stages were compared. Pretty straightforward. We're going to identify the gene. So um, the gene that had the lowest median CK value when bees of different Velma stages were uh, was the RPS5. RPS5 was this one right here. As you can see, the lowest Velma value right there. All you need to do is look at this. RPS5, boom, right about it in a sentence, done. That's the gene that had the lowest median CK value in that developmental stage. That's it. B, the CK value is inversely proportional, inversely is different, to the amount of mRNA from that gene in the starting sample. Based on the data in, in figure one, identify the gene that has the lowest level of gene express, uh, expression regardless uh, of variable. So look, the gene that has the lowest uh, gene expression is TP, uh, TBPAF. Why does that have the lowest one? So take a look at this one right here. So as we said earlier here, so gene expression is inversely proportional. So you're gonna pick the higher one. So when I'm looking at here, let me just make sure I'm doing this correctly. Doing this one right here. Yes, gene has the lowest level. Out of mRNA in the gene starting sample. Okay, so as you can see here, this one, it would be the highest and then you would do the inversely proportional. So, so the CK value of the highest would be the gene that has the lowest level uh, of that. So I'm pretty sure it's TBPAF. Um, to analyze that, okay, let's take a look. The scientists investigated the effect of pesticides on the expression of other genes in one cell type of a group of bees containing males and females in the same developmental stage. They hypothesized that this TBPAF would serve as the best control gene for the environment. Use the data to evaluate their hypothesis. Here's their proposed answer. Since only one type of cell, sorry, so since only one cell type is being used and all the bees are the same developmental stage, the only variable that varies is the sex of the bee. 
So I'll show you that in a bit. According to the data, the TBPAF had the narrowest range of CK values when the variable sex was examined, meaning that out of all four genes, the TBPAF is the least affected by sex. And this and this one we're looking at here. Okay, that one right there. Um, since the TBPAF gene will vary the least between the control Bs and the experiment, the best control gene, uh, uh, it is the best control gene for the experiment. All right, so look back at that if you need to, and we should be pretty good to go. Last one, I think. D, explain how the expression of genes such as the GAPDH, so a lot of this is reading the, um, and the graph that's shown here, can vary from one cell type to another with the same B. Yeah, how come the expression can change? So here's the proposed answer that we wrote out. Expression of a gene such as the GAPDH can vary from one cell type to another because the same B, uh, within the same B, because different types of cells have different types of receptors. So we've learned that what makes a cell different, it, it has the same DNA, but it has different uh, receptors, different transcription factors, different uh, activators, enhancers, et cetera, for hormones and their ligands. When different ligands bind to different receptors, they induce different signal transduction pathways within cells. These different signal transduction pathways being activated can result in different levels of expression of genes, such as the GAPTH from one cell type to another. All right, and that's the last one. Thank you everybody for watching to the end. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. I just hope this was helpful. I wish you the best on your AP exams. Remember, you are not defined by your AP score. When it comes out in July, You'll be all right. You have hundreds of more opportunities going forward to prove uh, what you've learned. Everyone has a great future ahead regardless. Please keep enjoying learning biology. That's what it's all about. And keep practicing. This is one test, once again, of many in your life, and you'll have many more chances to do well and or to study and to, and to show them what you've learned. So reflect, grow, and continue learning. Thanks for watching this video. I'll see you next year.